right now uh, in the city of New Orleans, I believe it's happening today. There's a vote in front of the city council about the healthy homes ordinance. And what that is more about is the fact that a lot of property owners after our storms don't properly mitigate and repair the properties, thus forcing citizens, mostly lower income citizens, community members of color, to live in these unsafe, unhealthy environments with mold, mildew, water damage, and things like that. So my... Hey guys, it's Mandy with Global Hemp Association. I wanted to say thank you so much for joining. I'm excited about the opportunity to build a relationship and connect this supply chain. I mean, after all, that's why we started the association. Our association was built on the foundation of connecting supply chain, building relationships, and helping you grow your business. Anyone from farmers, manufacturers, and distributors, people that are passionate about the supply chain, and those creating products selling into biofuels, plastics, textiles, construction, and building materials. I always love watching some of these commercials. It's been a long time since I've seen some of them, and I forget we're on Patreon, and I never give that shout out either. So, Joel, hello. Thank you very much for joining me today. Oh, it's a pleasure being here, Mandy. I appreciate you for uh, giving me the opportunity to be on your platform, talk more about what we're trying to get done. Heck yeah. I love that you're down in the South. And by the way, I have not been to Mississippi and I keep telling Nick, one of our members that I want to come down and spend some time down there never been to Louisiana either or, or um, anybody anywhere down there. So I will be looking my show. Yes. Yes. But welcome everybody. Thank you very much for joining. I'm excited about this conversation today. I'm really excited about being back live. Um, I hadn't been for a couple of days and over the summer we've been traveling a lot. And so I just realized how much I miss it and how much I enjoy the opportunity of getting to know everybody and getting to really dive into who people are and what they do and giving you guys an opportunity to connect. So I encourage you guys to run our YouTube channel, subscribe, and search different topics you're interested in and reach out, build those relationships in our industry. Um, rising tide raises all things. That's our goal. But Joel, before I get rambling too much, I'd love to hear from you. Tell the audience and tell our members who you are, what you do, and where you came from. Okay, no problem. Uh, my name is Joel Holton. Uh, I'm the founder of Grow Enterprises. And uh, Grow Enterprises is a social enterprise looking to provide healthier, sustainable, uh, affordable housing uh, using industrial based building components and underserved communities of colors in Louisiana and Mississippi, really throughout the Gulf South region. Uh, we, we're excited uh, with the startup venture to try to move uh, more awareness in our region, specifically uh, that these are healthier alternatives to conventional building methods and practices to give those individuals and communities that have been uh, really affected by the war on cannabis a fair opportunity to benefit from these uh, healthier alternatives. We, we seek to uh, really try to dive in and bring more educational awareness and also more, you know, hemp structures to our region. Yeah. What was your aha moment? What, what got you into hemp? You know, what did you do before your hemp life? <laughs> okay. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's an interesting story. Um, my background is in uh, restoration, remediation, and abatement work. So we, there's a, I own another company, and we do uh, mold remediation, uh, asbestos, lead-based paint abatement, uh, and water restoration. And I guess you can say I've been on the front lines of seeing what, uh, poorly developed building materials do to structures once they're affected uh, by like water and, and, and pest damage. So I started to look into alternatives, healthier alternatives, different alternatives to building components. And I actually really stumbled across hemp building just doing a, a, a traditional YouTube search. Like it popped up. I saw a video. Uh, I think the, the team was working out of France on the video and I was just watching it and I was like, this is not real. And yeah. then another video came up and it was a nonprofit out of Kentucky mm -hmm. who were building affordable homes mm -hmm. uh, using hemp creep. And, I, and then I started diving in that night. I mean, it's two in the morning. I go to sleep early. early. <laughs> you know me, I, I, I'm in the bed early because I get up early. So mm -hmm. it's two o'clock in the morning. I'm, I'm reading more about hemp creep and these industrial hemp based building components. And I'm like, 
there's no way they're pest resistant. There's no way they're mold resistant. There's no, there's no way they can mitigate humidity in a built environment. There's no way it could do all this because if it was, why isn't every house being built out of these products? That was, that was my takeaway. All the time. Well, if it was yeah. really this good, then why aren't we doing it? Exactly. And it was like, this is too, you know, like your mom said, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. But I just started diving deeper. Um, and I think my first real deep dive was reaching out to the U.S. Hemp Building Association. Big shout out to them. Yes. And uh, this was like in the middle of 2019. So this has been some time uh, trying to develop and learn and, and, and research more before we actually launched this new venture, because I wanted to make sure I had the right relationships and the right people who were willing to help me mm -hmm. and to help this thing grow. No, you know, that's why we named it what it is. We want to see this thing grow in our region. Um, another one was when, uh, so in talking to the USM Building Association, Mr. Eric McKee, I'm gonna leave some people out. Don't forgive me. <laughs> Cameron McIntosh, group of other people, Lady Mark Goldwire. Yes. A lot of great people were on that initial call with me and my architect, who's a buddy of mine as well. And they just start sharing information with us because they were excited which made us more excited to understand like, yeah, this is something that people are doing. And I think my other big high moment was when I was actually able to go visit the PA Hemp House in Newcastle, Pennsylvania. And Cam brought, said, man, you need to come up here. And I can actually <laughs> see, and I came up there. He's like, you serious, ain't you? I was like, yeah. And he, if he, if he hears this conversation, he'll remember when we were sitting there talking a lot at that hotel, just chopping it up, just talking. I love it. So his name has come up twice. Yesterday's interview was the same, that he's been very, Cameron's been very influential. Oh, he's that guy. He's that guy. Yeah. I, hope, I hope he is. If he's that guy. He's somebody that I really appreciate, appreciate and respect in this yeah. industry. Uh, like I said, we took the training with the e system back in April. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when I went to the PA Hemp House, he was like, bro, you really serious? He came up here. He's like, he said, ain't too many brothers out here in Newcastle, Pennsylvania. I was like, yeah, I know. That's why I'm here. Like, I'm serious. Like, I want to know more. And, we, you know, we want to connect with those allies that we know really want to see the industry move forward with no ego and no, and, and no headache. And they want to bring people in who are qualified and, and can understand what it's going to really take to get, get things done. And I, it's a big shout out. For, that's my guy, man. That's awesome. Well, yes, I agree. I'm going to second that because his name keeps coming up. For those of you who haven't watched, we have interviewed Cameron. So there is an interview on our YouTube channel. Go out and check it out. Um, I do want to say hello to Daryl and Tosh and Todd. They've been chiming in. Daryl said, hello, Joel. Uh, it's great to see you, sir. Thank you for everything that you're doing. Yes, for sure. Absolutely. Uh, and then like Tosh said, also, um, you know, it's the question that everybody's been asking. Why hasn't this already been done? It's too good to be true. Oh, after your visit in um, in Pennsylvania, tell me about what this process has looked at. Looked like. Where are you at now? Yeah. What are you doing now? Yeah, I think I think the the PA Hemp House was is the model. Big shout out to Lori Daigner too, as well mm -hmm. uh, with Don Services. You know, because she orchestrated how to get this done with like a public private collaboration and and funding. Yeah. the Department of Agriculture, she really shared the blueprint of how they did it, uh, where they're at. And uh, it, it was tremendous because it was like, people are already figuring this out. All I got to do is align myself and this, and this venture with the right people who can kind of guide what we need to do here in Louisiana. So right now we're at the phase this is a new venture uh i mean really at startup stage but we have uh some good things coming in the pipe in 2023 early 2023 we're trying to uh finalize some strategic partnerships as well uh with suppliers and and just consultants that can guide us on how we want to uh move and what products that we want to bring to the marketplace here in, in south louisiana and south mississippi uh so those things are are happening literally as we speak. We, um, we're we going to be at the Black Cannabis Conference and Expo in New Orleans tomorrow doing a breakout session at three o'clock. So if you're anywhere near New Orleans, come on down. It's going to be good. We're going to be talking about hemp building. 
uh, and green infrastructure to mitigate storm water, uh, storm water. So that's a key component in the Gulf South. If you're building something new, what are you gonna do when we have, uh, when we're in flood prone areas where we have to start mitigating, uh, you know, rainwater uh, and just being a better steward of the earth in general and how we can make uh, communities, underserved communities healthier uh, and safer. Because we know when these events happen, uh, most times it's those communities that suffer the most and they have the longest road to recovery. So mm -hmm. we have to incentive, we have to bring this to the forefront and our community partner, big shout out to the Dr. Angela Chalk at Healthy Community Services in New Orleans, because she is who put this retrofit together at her learning facility. She so wanted to partner with, with us uh, and made the investment and, and, and believed in what I was talking about. So in New Orleans, if you talk about it, you got to be about it, as we say. You know what I'm yeah. saying? You got to walk the walk. That's why we, you know, we grind and trying to get this done. So we will, after the convention, we'll have a bus ride over to the learning center and we'll be able to walk people through the learning center retrofit where we use hempcrete in the wall and we're using hemp wool in the ceiling and people will be able to see that and that's when i know more questions will start to come and people once they see it let's like for myself once i saw it and can feel it the questions start coming big shout out to him protection as well uh for, for i love having you on you're like calling out all the, the great i'm a team, I'm a team guy. Love this. Hey, I, I tell you i'm a team guy i grew yes. up in sports i'm all about team i love I it I I know I do the best work on a good team. I don't need no praise. I just want to get the job done and, and celebrate and be on the right team. So I love it. That'll be a theme through this whole conversation. The people who have helped us get to this point and the people that are going to help us move it forward because we do it all together because we're going to grow together. You know, it's, it's not about me at all. Trust me. <laughs> I love this. OK, so I want to talk real quick. We speak We we briefly mentioned some of the benefits to the hemp wool or the hemp crete that you're using, right? Where is it really playing a conversation or role in the conversation around the rainwater mitigation and the, I would assume mold. Um, yeah. Can you kind of speak about how have those conversations gone, um, especially for people that are also looking to either build or, you know, grow a business similar to yours in the same regions or same, you know, same climates. Oh, yeah. Right now uh, in the city of New Orleans, I believe it's happening today. There's a vote in front of the city council about the healthy homes ordinance. And what that is more about is the fact that a lot of property owners after our storms don't properly mitigate and repair the properties, thus forcing citizens, mostly lower income citizens, community members of color to live in these unsafe, unhealthy environments with mold mildew, water damage, and things like that. So my suggestion and the, the, the goal of GROW is to say, hey, let's start building these units out of healthier materials from the start that can be more uh, resistant to moisture, mold, uh, thermal performance, these type of things from the design stage instead of trying to retro. And then also post-disaster, if we do have to remove conventional building products, Let's start retrofitting these properties with these new alternative materials that will be more resistant in the future, uh, which could save a lot in the recovery process and post disaster process. So that's where the conversation is now, because we struggle all of our buildings down here in New Orleans struggle with high heat, humidity and pest issues like termites and things like that. So if we're using components that are naturally resistant to those things, we got to do it. And, but I think the biggest problem is, is people just don't know that this alternative exists just like I didn't know. And I, you know, I, I try to be on top of things like that, but that's part of the mission of grow is to be a highly functioning educational resource for communities, especially underserved communities where information tends to trickle down a little later than in other areas. We, we want to be on the forefront of, of helping uh, push hemp and hemp industry forward in our region and like i tell anybody i don't want to be the only person down here doing this i want other people to come in and say hey i think this is something we can build on and, and work together because i want to create a system that can be rinsed and repeated in any community in mm -hmm. our area mm -hmm. 
I love this. Okay, so I want to speak specific to some of the challenges in the BIPOC community, you know, around funding and around availability to these resources and where, you know, where can we that may not be emerged in that community really step up to, to provide support and to help bridge those gaps? Yeah, uh, most definitely. I think it's, it's just common knowledge that BIPOC led firms have issues with funding resources and different things like that. Uh, and just sustainability over time. So my key point to those questions is, please raise your hand and let us know that you want to help. You know, please reach out and, you know, and say, hey, I, I, I like what you're trying to do. How can I be a service? This is what I can help you with. This is my area. Because that's what we're going to have at the breakout session tomorrow at the Black Cannabis uh, Conference and Expo. It's going to be diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's going to be a group of individuals who all have different skill sets that want to help and share information. Big shout out to my boy, Matt Marino with Homeland Hemp Free. He's down. He's packing hemp for me right now so I can talk to you. <laughs> that is so yeah. awesome. Thank you. <laughs> That's my guy. That's what I said. I, I just want to get around the people who want to see this really grow and, and move forward and just share the information with me. And how can we have some kind of mutually beneficial, uh, you know, situation to where we all, we all do what we need to do. We all make money. We all are profitable. But more than profits is the impact on people and communities. That's our number one goal over profits. It that's is. Why, that's why we formed the social enterprise. We we're not focused. If we wanted to just be real estate developers, we would not have formed it the way we did. We want to make sure we're making more of an impact with education, workforce development, and sustainability than just making money. I love it. Okay, I want to give a shout out to some of the people that are listening in. There's lots okay. of questions. Um, one one question is, will insurance cover the hemp creek? And then Daryl later said that any permitted building is insurable. Um, were there some of these challenges that you faced as you started to dive into this project? Well. Yeah, that was one of the questions that a lot of people ask about insurance. And if you're in Louisiana right now, post Hurricane Ida, insurance is probably number one on your list of things to think about because we're having insurers leave the marketplace. It's harder to get coverage, but we feel like if we can explain to them how hempcrete, hemp wool, and these other uh, materials will be more resistant after a storm or most or more sustainable to where we don't have to tear out everything or demo everything. We think we can get the insurance companies to get more intrigued with what we're trying to do and maybe push other homeowners to use these products in their bills or maybe their post-disaster uh, restorations. So uh, on November the 29th here in New Orleans, we're gonna have another lunch and learn with the Home Builders Association of New Orleans where we really okay. get in front of some of the big, bigger players and say, hey, you want to know what hempcrete is? There's, it's right there on that wall. Go touch it, feel it, smell it, and then start asking me questions. You see that hemp wool insulation right there? Go lay on it, put your face on it, touch it, feel <laughs> it. Let me know what you think. Because you know you can't do that with traditional. Right. <laughs> so like, I can't imagine so, us being in a meeting and being like, hey, now everybody go rub your face on the insulin, the pink. Yeah, insulin. yeah, we, yeah. And, I, and, you know, we, these are the things that we know in our region make a difference when people can feel it, touch it and understand it a little bit more and have those those more intimate conversations uh, about, you know, the products and the, the methodology, the innovation. So that's that's what we want to push. Um, you know, the, the Black Cannabis um, Expo and Conference has Christy Price. Big shout out to Christy Price. She is that one that you need on your team. That's all I'm gonna say. And she, she gave us, she gave us the space to come in and to and to to do what we're doing. Uh, Want to give a, another big shout out to Anne Marie Sorrell with Cannabisiac, so which is a business incubator for BIPOC led firms that want to get in this cannabis space. So she took the idea of growth from a, just a concept that I had and to formalize it into what you see now, where we're actually on the ground, we're a startup venture and we're starting to try to get projects 
in the pipeline to do going into 2023. So big shout outs to those two women who have been instrumental uh, in, in getting us to where we're at now and to move forward and to continue in those relationships and just keep growing it. There's a reason it's called Grow Enterprises is there's a lot of areas that we want to see growth in, uh, in our community, especially when it comes to health, healthy living and sustainability. Awesome. Okay, so there have been quite a few questions that came in. Okay, cool. Uh, shoot, from shoot. Tosh and Kathy. Well, a lot of them are about the structural aspects of hemp okay. And I want to um, kind of address it real quick, really quickly, that yesterday we did an awesome interview that talked a lot about this and then actually showed with blocks where it's being used in both steel structure and wood frame or timber frame. Mm -hmm. um, and that it is an insulative property as well as the, the lime um wow i'm having a brain fart coating the, the lime, lime binder not the binder the finish oh the um, plaster finish yeah. plaster thank you i could yes. not think the finish and how it's applied and some of those benefits and so hemp 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 creed itself is not structural but people are building uh with structural components right components like, it, like yeah. steel, steel rods or the wood like i said timber frame and so forth yes. there's another question on here really addressing the the termites um in your area you know what is preferred yeah. for building structure in your area um specifically with hempcrete yeah so uh, the first part of that question we we are promoting uh hempcrete purely as an insulating material mm -hmm. just to kind of avoid some of the restrictions that may be imposed uh, based on our building codes and things like that. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the first part of that. Now, when it comes to termites and, and, and those type of pests in our environment, a lot of times the termites come as a result of some kind of moisture intrusion into the framing of mm -hmm. the home or the structure of the home. So it's like moisture than termites. So you telling me I can, I can have a product that kills helps eliminate moisture, mold, and the termites, we, we got a solution there. And that's the thing. We, like, we have to find ready solutions that are already in use to continue to, you know, build these healthier homes. You know, we, we got to get away. Like I tell anybody here in Louisiana, we got to get away from what we know because we know what we know is not working. <laughs> and it's, not, yes. <laughs> it's not working. Like, you know, Louisiana is number... 50th in a lot of categories. You know why? Because what we're doing is not working. Yeah. That's not a winner's mentality to just be in the game. You can't keep doing the same thing and expecting yeah. different results, right? It's yeah. And I, I'm very inspired by Mr. Uh, Gary Chambers. Uh, if you're going to vote the U.S. Senate election in Louisiana, please vote for Brother Gary Chambers. Uh, I'm hoping to get the opportunity to meet this good brother during the conference. He's the keynote opening speaker at the Black Cannabis Expo and Conference. Today, he might be speaking right now. And I just want him to know if he sees this, I echo a lot of your sentiments uh, of how to move Louisiana forward, especially when it comes to the cannabis and hemp industries being a key player moving forward in the economic redevelopment of our community. So, you know, I don't get too political on any level, but that when I see somebody that's trying to do something different and they're passionate about it, I'm gonna support it. I don't want anybody around me that doesn't have passion. I don't care what it's about. If you're passionate, I want you around me. If you kind of ho hum, you won't isn't see it, me too often. Isn't it refreshing well, the passion that the hemp industry brings out? Yeah, and it was refreshing. It was refreshing for me because I, I come from a construction background and sharing information and trade secrets is not something that is usually done. It's quite the opposite a lot of times. Uh, people like to keep you under their thumb and limit what you know. And when I reached out to the U.S. Hemp Building Association, uh, it was the total opposite. That's how I knew I was in the right space with the right people. Uh, I love it. So we, we, we're going to just keep pushing it. That's the key, right? If we're going to get this done, we've got to share the education and knowledge. Can you speak a little bit about the consumer awareness? Um, and then I, I, I'd like to kind of go back also to the specific question around funding and BIPOC. You know, what are some of those? Yeah. Well, consumer awareness is kind of low where, where we at here in New Orleans and South Mississippi and Louisiana. That's why we understand that uh, workshops and outreach, these components of the business are going to have to be instrumental 
to get a consumer awareness up so they know that there's alternatives. I think there's a lot of people in our in our region who would love to use these products, but they're just not aware that they're available or that this is an alternative. And that's some of the main point that we're going to try to get out uh, tomorrow during the breakout session because we have invited a lot of realtors, real estate brokers, uh, real estate professionals, construction professionals uh, to come out and say, hey, there's alternatives here. There's better there's better products than you. There's healthier products. There's more natural products. They're products that will actually uh, save your your uh, clients money over time with the mm -hmm. thermal performance of uh, the, the products and different things like that. So it's imperative that we we spend as much time trying to uh, do community outreach and, and raise the awareness of consumers. And, you know, that that's we I understood that. that's why I took my time before launching this venture. This has been a couple of years in the making. Uh, COVID actually helped me a lot because it made me have to sit down in my other business and not be able to go anywhere and really start reaching out to people around the country and around the world uh, to get information. So, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things where I feel like the timing is right because the conversation in our city is about healthy homes. And that conversation is happening today. And it's like, well, if you truly want healthier homes, you have to start building them out of healthier materials. Mm -hmm. Like that's the point. You can't put all the onus on the property owner uh, to do certain things if they don't understand that there's different alternatives that will also save them money in the long run and headache over the long run to use these products. So it's I think it's even, like you said, this lack of maybe education or awareness as a home buyer, right? I just assume that it's the most efficient, that my home is being built the most efficient way. Exactly. That's not right. And so there's no. the assumptions and this disconnect in processes that I think hemp has unfolded for me and unfolded for a lot of people, you know, and brought this awareness around, like you said, the, this is the, the health of our home or the healthiness of the home. Yeah, definitely post COVID or well not, I can't say post COVID, but in, during this pandemic, we know we spent a lot of time Yes. In, in our houses. So we spend about 90% of our total time inside the built environment, whether it's at work or at home. So you have to understand that that constant barrage of toxicity and VOCs that's off gassing out of those components is entering your body. So mm -hmm. if we can eliminate that in our built environments and start using hemp based products and components, then we know that we, we've eliminated a, a hazard pretty much from our built environment. And that's why we need to really start pushing uh, the awareness. We know we understand that, like I said, education is gonna be a major component. Consumer and property owners and developers, construction professionals as well, more aware that these alternatives exist. And if you do have clients uh, that are seeking these out, then it's there and we can help you source those. And we can, you know, we, we're gonna keep sharing information the same way others have shared with us. You know, we're going to keep the ball moving downfield to make sure that there's more. Like I said, I don't want to be the only person in Louisiana or Mississippi doing this. I want to be one that promotes that more people get involved. Uh, this is this is the time to make a change. I think we're at a point in our country's history where we realize that we need to take more control and ownership of our supply chain and start producing more and start doing more inside these borders to help the local economy. Otherwise, our children and our children's children are going to be in trouble. <laughs> they, won't, they won't stand a chance. Yes. Okay. So there, there's some questions I want to address really quick. Oh, I yeah, see Ernie. Good. Ernie has been fabulous. Thank you so much for joining. And I was curious along these lines also about what available data is out there so that when we're, when you're educating and when we're promoting to really drive consumer demand and consumer awareness about the benefits of these alternative materials. What data is out there? And have you done small side-by-side -side, um, building comparisons with conventional building materials? Yes. So that's a great question. So one of our strategic partners, uh, Matt Marino with Homeland Hempcrete is actually, he, he's, he's in the process. They have built a side-by-side -side, uh, hemp build right next to a, a one with conventional building products. And they're actually 
monitoring and getting collecting data from the performance of those two side by side buildings to be able to share that with us uh, moving forward. So it, it's, it's kind of some of this stuff is actually happening right now. Uh, big shout out to Matt and his team for being able to, to pull that off and, and to really be a true source of information by doing these uh, comparative uh, builds and, and then just sharing that information with us and what we could do. We actually had a, a conversation last night about the information because some of the information uh, is more pertinent to us here in South Louisiana, like how much moisture passes through those walls because we, we deal with such high heat and humidity uh, in this region for sustained periods of time that if we can start regulating the moisture that comes into that built environment and also filtrating that, that, that air and, and moisture that comes through there, then that's kind of a game changer in our region. Because one thing I realized when I went to the PA Hemp House, I went in June, it was about 90 degrees outside. And when we walked into the, the structure, it was about 72 degrees inside that structure. And nothing was up but the, the spray insulation and the framing. And the temperature never changed the whole two hours we were in that building. I know the temperature changed outside, but it didn't change inside that. So that, for me, told me a couple of things. It's like, first of all, one, you need to get on this. Two, <laughs> this is a game changer in the sense of being more... Uh, you know, using less energy and cooling a house. So in our region, it's like, it's not so much about heating because we don't really have a, a true winter. It's more about those six to seven months where you're trying to cool that structure down and using less energy and, and being able to regulate the humidity in that environment, which will also help you regulate the temperature and the comfortability of, of the environment in general. So those type of, that type of data is something that we, we're definitely uh, waiting to to get from Matt and his team and, and work with them on uh, doing more. Uh, yeah, Homeland Hemp Creek, I saw something come up. They're actually in Bismarck, North Dakota. And uh, he is, uh, he's the man too. That's another guy along with Cam for me, who really is training me and teaching me and sharing the information that we need to be successful here in New Orleans. So, uh, you know, like I said, you're going to hear me shout out a lot of people because it's about the team. It's about the group of people who really want to see this grow and move forward and not try to hold and hog tie all the information and the fame and the pass on. But I don't need none of that. I just want none to of see. us are going to get anywhere if we do that. Yeah. They're too yeah, small. There are, there are, we are entering industries that have been established for years with trillions of dollars invested into their infrastructure. And so, to think that we we can scale and become a mainstream product alone, we're pure crazy. The thing about it, they know that this is a better alternative. They've been yes, there. yes. That's why they're scared. See, people don't get scared if they if they like. Oh, well, that's not. That's Are not they scared, or is it now a reality? Because I hear this over and over again, and I'm sure that there's two extremes, right? But I keep hearing, you know, people that have worked with the big chemical companies and worked in the plastics and the petroleum, you know, that say like, we need to, we need to do something to fix. You know, for my own conscience yeah. and for what I didn't know, now we know. We have to make a shift. We have to make a change for what's better for our planet, for what's better for our for our people. And for the first time, we have an opportunity to be more sustainable and profitable, right? Yeah. We can do this and it can be something, right? It is going to take a paradigm shift and it is going to take an adjustment in the way things are done. But um, yeah, we've got to be able to get you can do it. You can do good and make good money too. That's that's kind of one of my mottos. You can, you can make the impact and make good money. But I also think uh, that it's key to realize, like you said, like a restorative type of justice. It's also key that we realize that certain communities have been more disinvested and disenfranchised than others. And we need the assistance of our allies to come in and say, hey, this is something that we might want to do. And I think these communities need to be first in line to receive these benefits because we were first in line to get the consequences. So it's, it's kind of, I don't like really using the word social equity in a sense, because I, I feel like you can create your own social equity if you have the right group of people with a sense of group economics uh, that can help each other. 
generate the, the, the economic mm -hmm. recovery that's needed. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there was a, a couple of questions. One, did we talk about the fire retardant aspects? We did briefly. Do you want to touch on that just a little bit? Like, where is it comparing to some of the other other materials? So uh, we know there's been uh, Hempertex has done a lot of testing with the uh, the fire resistance of uh, hempcrete and these uh, materials. So we know it actually is more fire resistant than conventional you know, uh, building components and different things that people are using every day now. So, you know, like I said, the benefits outweigh the cost to me. You know, a lot of people, that's the main thing I'm hearing. How much does this cost? How much does this cost? How much does this cost? It's like, well, let's start asking another question. How much value? How much value? How much value am I bringing to something? Because well, this yeah. was really put into perspective for me and something that, again, is this education piece where I was disconnected. Way back when, and I don't want to quote dates or time frames or exact numbers, but the point is, years ago, you could build a home, and it, you had a minute, for example, and it, a certain period of time to get out of the home before you died, basically, right? If the house caught on fire, you were, you you had so much time. Today, that time is is shrunk to seconds before damage happens. But right. that is something that, again, looks back to the value, the long-term value to that dollar versus that transaction, that transition. And, you know, the interview yesterday, we talked a little bit about this also. You know, you may have $20,000 more in your upfront cost, but over how long do you save in heat and power and you know, mm -hmm. your gas bill, your utilities, uh, let alone it's safety components and health components that are added to it. And so, yeah, I, I, and I think the question that consumers and developers and everybody needs to ask yourself, if, if you pose it like this, if I could tell you that if you spend an extra $25,000 this year over the 30 year life of that mortgage, you would save $300,000. Would you make that $25,000 investment? Yeah, probably so. You see what I mean? So it's like, it's all in how you look at it. And we understand that uh, economics plays a huge part in everything we do, especially in underserved communities. So that's why we're really looking for strategic partnerships that can help us find grant funding and, and philanthropic funding in order to collaborate together so we can fill some of those, those gaps in the upfront construction and development costs of these projects. You know, so that's, you know, this is, it's paramount that we know uh, that there is there's a way to, there's a way to find a solution to offer affordable, safer, healthier housing to individuals who traditionally wouldn't be able to to access them. So, and I think affordable housing is something that's on everybody's mind right now with the price of housing across the country, uh, specifically in New Orleans. Uh, we're basically getting priced out of this city. Uh, and, and we got to do something about it. Those who care about this city and this region, especially post Katrina, we've got to do something about it from the inside out. Mm -hmm. And that's why I say any allies that are, wish, that are wishing to participate and help, please just raise your hand, reach out and say, hey, I think I could bring something to the table. And let's, let's start sitting down and, and having these conversations because I don't know who to ask for help until they let themselves be known. You know, so I, you know, we, we have to get there. And I think we're getting there. I think the hemp industry is, is, is an industry where it's going to be a little bit different than big, you know, mainstream cannabis because there are so many individuals looking to share information and to help others out. Okay. So I, speaking of grants, you know, as an association, this is a topic that comes up a lot and there is a lot of money lot a lot of money available right now to address some of these issues or some of these concerns that we're talking about and so we've put together a committee where we're going to start reviewing grants and building teams and helping to support jha has a fabulous grant writing team we've got a number of people through our you know through our association that have been funded for grants and so we'd love to i'd love to, have to invite you come and sit down please, and please. You know, if you see grants that come to the table and you're missing pieces or not sure where to go next, reach out to us and see if we can start putting projects together. Each of us have parts to play and each of these grants are requiring partnership and collaboration and they're big picture projects. And so, Joel, I'd love to support you on this and I'd love to, you know, yeah. 
to anybody else also. But oh man, I, I love that and I appreciate that. And and that's the these are the conversations that we need to have. We need to understand like who's willing to to help and who's willing, you know, where you're where you're weak at, I may be strong where I'm, you know, vice versa. You know, so those are the things that I know I need help with. And as an organization, we need help with because we do know there's monies out there, but where do we start and who do we collaborate with and who is really looking to see underserved communities have their own sense of equity and, mm -hmm. and, and, and like we, we want to rebuild and do better for ourselves as well. Like, you know, we, we're not waiting. We know waiting on the government to do certain things is just not probably going to happen. So we have to internally understand what we need to do in order to provide, you know, a safe, healthier house, mm -hmm. housing units for, you know, our community, you know, mm -hmm. and, and just trust the fact that there are great individuals who want to help and also see that same vision uh, come to pass. So, you know, I appreciate that, Mandy. Like I said, I, I haven't known you very long, but I go with my gut on a lot of things and I, I, I can just feel when people are genuine and real and that's all I need. I just need people, people to be themselves and be genuine and real and we can, we can do a lot together just with that. You know, what's been amazing is how the conversation and being able to breed collaboration through conversation has helped to weed out a lot of those players. Yeah, because your energy is, is not right. Yeah, well, so, and yeah. people talk, right? You yeah, start yeah. talking and pretty soon people start to figure out who's done right and who hasn't. And I, yeah. we look at what's important in taking care of the people and our farmers and you know, people that that had their hand in these projects, those still are equally as, as important. And so surrounding yourself, you know, the, the saying birds of a feather flock together is, is no joke. And so Yeah, no, it, it's very true, especially especially down south. Good people know good people, good people deal with good people. And yeah. we, we, we know like, you know, people that know that come to me and, you know, have questions or want to work, they know, first of all, Joe's going to be fair. And he's going to do everything he can to see the, the project be successful, mm -hmm. you know. So those key things, you know, all the personality stuff and all that. It's not as important to me as it is to others, because I don't have to fall in love with you to get stuff done with you. <laughs> you see what I mean? Like, but we can I, respect I, each other and not got to respect. You got to respect. Yeah. You got to work. Yeah, that's it. If you got good respect for each other and that good work ethic. And you want to put it down, you can get it done. That's yes. it. We keep it simple. Cause uh to go back to my man Cameron, man, he when he got us up, got me up there to uh Pennsylvania for the Ereasy training, and I actually was able to work with that wand and that instrument and that equipment. I knew I said, Yeah, I said, bro, you're a dog, because this is real work. This ain't <laughs> you know, like this is this you you've been putting it down for a minute and I and that respect level just grew, you know, and, and that's that's it. It's just being able to have certain conversations with individuals and spending some time getting to know people for who they are at mm -hmm. their core is going to push this industry forward. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be the good people who who are going to also be impactful and profitable, you know, yeah, and that's, that's what we want. When people say all the time, well, I want to get into the hemp industry, I always say, well, what drives your passion? Yeah. What about your life or what you know is really fueling your fire? Because hemp plays a role in it, it'll touch anything, right? Yeah. We, can, we can put it in that that spot. So it's it really is. It's about what, you know, who gets behind it. I think that's where the passion comes from. Um, I want to really quick go back to Ernie made a comment again. And Ernie, thank you. I'm glad you kind of picked up what I was trying to say. So house fires today, a fully involved or fully engulfed house fire today can be as quick as 12 minutes. Old school stick builds would be in excess of 20 estimated times, obviously. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we add hemp to this and now we give our family or our you know pets or time to get out of a fire or to you know, even leave the home standing. I just can't imagine the impact or the difference that we would be facing, the different scenarios we'd be facing in places like Louisiana or California or, you know, some of these areas that are just wiped out by fire. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, we, a lot of the mission of Grow Enterprises is more about health and safety. Mm -hmm. You know, like we, we've scaled it down to, to those kind of components. Like, we want people in a healthier home mm -hmm. and a safer environment. 
So mm -hmm. if we can start eliminating flood prone areas from flood waters, that's a safety issue. If we can use components that will not ignite and combust as quickly as conventional components, that's a safety component. So everything comes back to kind of a healthy, a health, safety and wellness ideology of why we're doing what we're doing. I think a lot of people, you know, get introduced to hemp creed and these hemp based building components. And it's like, man, that's cool. I didn't know you could do that with the plant. I didn't know that this was a, a, a alternative. And it's like, yeah, because it's a healthier, safer alternative. And that's where we try to steer the conversation. Like, you know, we we're talking about health, safety and wellness more so than just building houses or developing uh, properties and projects. So, you know, that that's the core of our, our mission and our vision to see underserved communities in healthier and safer environments. I love it. You know, there's this is we as a society have no problem investing additional money into sprinkler systems, like Ernie just said, or solar panels that will long term save us money. Right. What we're doing is actually starting at the build of the home and adding these so that then this home no longer needs some of these additional additives or or may, but then would even add additional benefits, right? That, that even surpass. And so, yeah, that's it, actually, it actually begins in the design stage. The yes. design yeah. and, and the uh, pre-construction stage where we're examining why, like we understand like green infrastructure and the hemp, the hemp building components, they work in tandem because what the green infrastructure installation is going to do is going to help mitigate flooding on the property. But we also know that the hemp building, uh, hemp based components is going to help mitigate moisture in the built environment. So both components are helping to eliminate water hazards or water related hazards. So they work in concert together. That's why our collaboration with Healthy Community Services and WaterWise Gulf South, two uh, nonprofits here in New Orleans who are pushing neighborhoods and community members to be more uh, aware of like green infrastructure installations like uh, rain barrels, uh, bio swells, rain gardens, things that can help with uh, water and mitigate flooding on their property. Because right now in New Orleans, I'll be honest with everybody listening, we're having some major issues just with average thunderstorms. Uh, you know, it's, 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 cutting off certain areas of the city, you know, where you can't even travel. Like one time I was, it was like three o'clock in the afternoon and we had a heavy downpour and I was trying to get from New Orleans East back over to uh, mid city and everybody that's familiar with New Orleans understands what I'm saying. Uh, but it's about a 10 mile track. And I literally had to pull over on the side of the road and just wait for like three hours. Cause I couldn't get to my house. Like, and this is on a regular Tuesday, afternoon heavy thunderstorm and at that point i was getting frustrated but that frustration led me to start start thinking of solutions what can we start doing more to help a, a very aged infrastructure here in new orleans like it's an old city infrastructure is poor mm -hmm. there's supposed to be tons of money coming through uh for in infrastructure repairs and things like that i I'm, I'm still waiting on seeing the results of some of that. Maybe there is more time I need to give it. But right now, how do we live day to day with these type of issues? And I think it's going to take personal homeowners and communities and community organizations like Healthy Community Services and WaterWise Gulf South to actually give the trainings and, 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 and give the information to individual homeowners on what they can do and also the funding sources that could help them do those things. So it, it's just, it's a group effort, everybody. I mean, there's, we have a lot of problems that need solutions, uh, especially in our community. So we, we just need to collaborate with those who can help us to, to, to kind of find that balance where we're actually solving problems. Because these problems call, cross racial lines, they cross social economical lines, Mm -hmm. they, they cross religious lines. They, they, everybody's dealing with the same thing. So there have been a couple questions that have come in, you know, kind yeah. of back to this funding side, not necessarily strategic to, um, you know, bike pop communities, but in general, the upfront cost and this concern that hemp is more expensive, right? And so 
What type of initiatives do you see that may become available or that you're seeing available or you know, maybe uh, tax breaks or, or funding grant money that's available for this upfront cost as new builders that don't have that yeah. That budget, right? Because really the markets we're targeting are not those markets that have this exorbitant budget or that have the allowance to say, listen, I'm going to still grow, you know, build this small home, but I'm going to add an extra $20,000 in cost. They may not be able to do that. It's either build the home or not build the home. For them. Yeah. That. Well, I, I think this is the, the question we got to ask is like, if there's monies out there to subsidize some of these costs, how do how do we get to that? Yes. If there are tax incentives that help subsidize some of these costs, who can help me figure that out? And then on the back end of that, being able to understand, being able to educate the consumer on why this is a better option. Because you, you think about, okay, if, if I have somebody in that, that range, that lower to moderate income range, their first goal is home ownership in general. That's a major step for them and their family and their uh, generational wealth chain. So to say to those individuals, well, you know, if you spend 20 more thousand, then you can get such a better superior product. Well, that $20,000 is just not there, but there could be some kind of state, federal, local program that could fill that gap. And that's why I need people like you, man, in Global Health Association to say, Hey, Joe, did you know that there's grant funding for first time home buyers to buy more healthier, resilient homes? Well, man, I didn't know that. Thank you for telling me. How do we how do I get that information to the people who can really use it? And how can I be just a conduit uh, of that information? Like, I don't want anything out of it. Yeah, maybe they'll call or buy one of our properties, whatever. But how can I share that information with my community and be that bridge in, in the information uh, chain to, to get it? you know, to the people that really can use it. Uh, I think everybody understands that BIPOC led firms have issues with funding. That's why I also suggest that there has to be a little bit more of what I call group economics. Those who do have and do have resources, pooling money together and pooling resources together in order to get some of these things done. And that's, that's one of the things we've done with the retrofit project at Healthy Community Services in the seventh ward in New Orleans. Me and Angela, we're, we're pulling money together. She had some funds uh, to do some things. I said, well, look, if we can, if can you can you handle some of the cost of these materials? What I'll do is I'll bring the people in. We'll, we'll provide labor. Uh, we'll help promote the workshop. You know, different things like that. Like these are all things. It's just group. It's just group economics. You got a little. I got a little. Somebody over there may have a little and we put it together and we, we, we accomplish that goal. So th th those elements right there are key to success moving forward. Now, what I would hope and wish is that there's more federal money and state money that can come down and say, hey, Joe, we need affordable housing, period. But we would really like to build healthier, more affordable homes. And I say, yeah, well, how many? we need 100 of them. OK, well, let's, let's do that. And that's where we're trying to strategically position ourselves and our partners to say, hey, there's grant funding that's going to come down. You know, we need to get ready to scale this thing up. Also, before I get off this telecast, I want to give a big shout out to the Urban League of Louisiana and also Propeller, which are two organizations uh, in the New Orleans area that have really helped me uh, in my business development and, and just having the uh the skills and 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 the and the, the guts i'll just say the guts to jump out here and and really push my vision of what i see and i know can happen in this city in this region so i i don't want anybody to feel slighted if i didn't mention you today because we all know like you know I, i'm a team player i want to see everybody there's a lot of people out there. I always yeah. feel like as soon as I get on stage or on camera, it's like, okay, I want to give some people the highlight. And it's like, oh, oh. And as soon yeah. as we hit up, yeah. it's like a flood of all the people that have been great. And so yeah. there is there is a reason people write it on cue cards during yeah, the Yeah, I, 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 I need to. I need to. Yes. I need to just a lot of them because you did I great. Know it, it's just people investing in me, organizations investing in me. They, they, they hear my vision. I guess they can feel the passion that I have for what I want to do. And they say, well, Joe, we're going to give you the opportunity. 
And that's one of the things Dr. Angela Chalk did. She said, hey, this is your thing, man. Come in there. I'm giving you the space and the opportunity to prove this concept. And that's what we're doing right now. So, it's, it, you know, and then same thing with the Black Cannabis Expo and Conference. Uh, Chrissy Price said, hey, I, I've been hearing about what you're trying to do. We talked a couple times. I talked to her cousin, Aaron Hayes. Big, big shout out to her. Aaron Hayes with Reserve NOLA. She kind of tied us all together last year when uh, the conference was here in New Orleans. And it just kept growing because I knew I wanted to make a long-term commitment to that conference and that organization and this movement in the greater Gulf South, you know, cause we have so many more states in the South Southern region that are coming online with medical cannabis, uh, pretty soon, hopefully going recreation. You know, this thing is growing by leaps and bounds very fast. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's time. And to borrow a line from Outcast, is, you know, the South has something to say. The South has something it. to say. We, we definitely understand our role and where we're at, but we also understand how we've been systematically disenfranchised by very racist uh, cannabis laws and policies. So we, 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 we want to reverse that, and we want to reverse that for ourselves first. Well, I'm impressed. Like I said, you've got an ally in us. We'd love to collaborate. I'd love to help, you know, be this conduit, like you said, for information so we can get it to the people that are going to use it. Um, I did send you a calendar invite for the reoccurring grant meeting so that we can okay. start. It may be something short. It may be one week. We don't have any any new grants. It may be another week that five of us have found some really powerful grants. Uh, Sandra, I saw in here also, you know, we may want to consider some crowdfunding options and ideas. And that's something we yeah. can talk about right is throw together we've seen that um, and Sandra I'll add you to that grant email as well so anybody else that's looking to collaborate and put grants together and like I said really build these teams for the right reasons um, I also recognize that not every group or every partnership is going to be for everybody so we are not setting this up with the intent that this has to work but in with the intent of providing opportunities to really dive into some grants and and get some projects together um, from this, I assume that we'll break off into smaller groups so that only the grant people working on specific grants will be sharing details. And so yeah. um, I want there to be the value add there that this is really a brainstorming discussion to what grants are available and how do we open them up so that more people in our industries can can start to receive funding for these, you know, all these purposes, all these reasons. We can help. Yeah. It, it, it's a group. Of, it's a part. It's partnerships. It's collaboration. It's individuals like John Renthorpe, who's the executive director of the New Orleans Black Chamber of Commerce, who's always been very supportive of these ideas that I've had. Uh, we talked a couple months ago, and he was like, because I did a, a pitch uh, competition, and, and I brought the hemp building to the forefront. And, uh, you know, we have public officials who are also very interested. You know, so it's like there's, there's individuals that see and ready to be more progressive in thought in our area. And that's what we need. You know, it's like one of those things, hey man, what we doing ain't working. So what can we do differently and how do we get there? And, and I realize that we do need information and assistance from those outside of the region in order to make that difference. And it's like, that's fine with me because I'll go anywhere. I'll go to Newcastle, Pennsylvania, I'll go to you're in Salt Lake City, it, it don't really matter to me because I understand that, you know, you can't do everything where you're at. You know, you, sometimes you have to get information from other places and bring it back and, 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 and to teach those who can't move around like you can and, and just, like I said, be that kind of doing of information to make sure that, you know, everybody's getting equal access to the information. If I can get the information, I feel like I can make it work. You know. uh, yes. Yeah. Well, and you've got the passion and the drive. So Joel, thank you for everything that you're doing. I'm impressed. I'm I'm extremely blessed, I guess, to be standing next to more people that are passionate for the right reasons and really working to you know, build and lift other people. So thank you for everything that you're doing. It's exciting. Um, shout out to you uh, for letting me come on your platform and, uh, yeah. and, and talk. And I know there's a lot more that can be done. Uh, so I, I, I want to say thanks to you. Because uh, you didn't have to do this, you know. So I'm all forever grateful. Oh, I'm 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 excited about your progress. I'm excited to show it again. So as you continue to develop, let's check back in and let's share your progress. And as soon as I can come down, I would love to connect. 
In fact, I don't know if you know Shane Mutter. Um, he's in Louisiana. I'll have to connect to you. He'd be a great person. He's involved in the industry also with Element 6 Dynamics. So uh, great members, great supports of our, of our association and what we're doing. So thank you again, Joel, for everything. How real quick, if somebody wants to get involved or has questions, how do they reach you? Okay, so uh, on, you can go on social media. Uh, our, our Instagram is GRO underscore enterprises. That'd probably be the best and easiest way to get at us. And our website is grow, G-R-O, enterprises.biz. So those are the two uh, main ways to get at us. Uh, follow us on Instagram and just direct message me. Get at, I'm kind of old school with just calling and getting with people, but I'm slowly uh, <laughs> getting more uh, social media savvy so people can contact us like that. So we're going to actually be posting a lot of good video and information over the next several days about the work we're doing with the Black Cannabis Expo and Conference and also with the Retrofit Project we're doing at Healthy Community Services in New Orleans. So, so cool. it's, a, it's a good time to follow us. <laughs> That's so cool. cool. Well, I can't wait to see the videos. Please share them with us. I'd love to push yeah. them out. I'd love to highlight what you're doing and kind of show it off, especially being in the area you are, right? There's been a lot of yeah. questions too. What kind of processing is going on down there? So. Mm -hmm. Of you that had questions if you had questions and we didn't get to them please reach out other than that please reach out to joel or myself offline we'd love to collaborate and help support you and joel i look forward to connecting with you again here in the new future near future for sure i appreciate you mandy and uh let's keep doing the good work absolutely thank you guys i appreciate everything and we'll see you real quick i forgot to mention next week we've got another awesome interview and then um i'll be up in montana so if anybody's up in montana i will be up traveling going to visit rusty congratulations for the new job at ind hemp but visiting with him and chris from um us one logistics they're a fab fabulous logistics company if you don't know who they are um, be sure to connect um, and then again, just a reminder, if you guys have questions or are looking to connect with specific people, Global Hemp Association membership gives you a directory where you can connect with people. We've laid out the processors. And then we're also doing our fiber trials and collecting data that we should have back by the end of this month. So it's pretty exciting to highlight um, or to be able to see, you know, what genetics are working where. where wow what genetics are working well where and really some consistent up and downs with different genetics and so it's exciting to be able to to put that out so we can help um and then our goal next year joel is to do a grain and fiber trial in louisiana in multiple states partnered with a local university and so let's let's talk a little bit more about that offline because obviously that's a goal for next year depending on our grant and our funding so please support global hemp association become a member donate on our friends of hemp campaign um, we've got a great match coming up here at the end of this month for the good giving challenge so you can double your donation or double the value of your donation but thank you guys very very much we'll see you see you next time joel all right see you appreciate you thank you have a wonderful day you guys see ya